A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has bestowed on us in Christ every spiritual blessing in the heavens. God chose us in him before the world began to be holy and blameless in his sight, to be full of love. He likewise predestined us through Christ Jesus to be his adopted sons. Such was his will and pleasure that all might praise the glorious favor he has bestowed on us in his beloved. It is in Christ and through his blood that we have been redeemed and our sins forgiven. So immeasurably generous is God's favor to us. God has given us the wisdom to understand fully the mystery, the plan he was pleased to decree in Christ, to be carried out in the fullness of time, namely, to bring all things in the heavens and on the earth into one under Christ's headship. In him we were chosen, for in the decree of God, who administers everything according to his will and counsel, we were predestined to praise his glory by being the first to hope in Christ. In him you too were chosen when you heard the glad tidings of salvation, the word of truth, and believed in it. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit who had been promised. He is the pledge of our inheritance, the first payment against the full redemption of a people God has made his own to praise his glory. Verbum Domini. Show us, O Lord, your kindness and grant us your salvation. You have favored, O Lord, your land. You have forgiven the guilt of your people. You have covered all their sins. You have withdrawn all your wrath. You have revoked your burning anger. Will you not instead give us life, and shall not your people rejoice in you? Show us, O Lord, your kindness, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what God proclaims, the Lord, for he proclaims peace to his people and to his faithful ones, and to those who put in him, put in him their hope. Near indeed is the salvation to those who fear him, glory dwelling in our land, kindness and truth shall meet, justice and peace shall kiss. Dominus vobiscum, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Mateum. Jesus said to his disciples, If a man wishes to come after me, he must deny his very self take up his cross, and begin to follow in my footsteps. Whoever would save his life will lose it, 
but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What profit would a man show if he were to gain the whole world and destroy himself in the process? What can a man offer in exchange for his very self? The Son of Man will come with his Father's glory, accompanied by his angels. When he does, he will repay each man according to his conduct. Verbum Domini. Take up your cross and follow me. November 26 is the feast day of a Franciscan saint, and his name is St. Leonard of Port Morris, whose name our brother Leonard was given after. And St. Leonard lived from 1676 to 1751. Uh, St. Alphonsus Liguori, a doctor of the church in moral theology, called him the great missionary of the 18th century. Uh, it was said that after completing his uh, college studies, uh, he thought of entering uh, the medical profession. But soon he perceived that God has a different uh, plan for him. And how this came about was he happened to visit uh, the church that was connected with the Franciscan friary of St. Saint, Saint Bonaventure in Rome. So he went in there, and at that moment that he went in, uh, the choir was chanting the verse at night prayer that said, Convert us, O God, our salvation. And so when he heard that, that line, his heart was moved, and he took them uh, as a call uh, from God to follow him through the Franciscan uh, way of life. And so he did enter on October 2nd, 1697. He had a very strong desire to preach the gospel to China, to become a missionary there, and even to shed his blood for the faith. However, his uh, weak body uh, really prevented him to do so, and, even, and actually he got really uh, sick at that time, but thanks to our Blessed Mother who uh, cares and loves for her children most uh, tenderly, uh, Leonard of Port Maurice was miraculously, um, you know, restored to health through her intercession. Again, St. Alphonsus Liguoria said that he is the great missionary of the 18th century. He's a tireless missionary, and, but at the end, after 43 years doing missionary work, he came back to the Friary exhausted and died the night that he arrived, uh, which was November 26, uh, 1751. Later on, he was beatified, canonized, and, and later appointed as a patron of uh, Paris missions. And, of course, due to what happened to his health being restored through Our Lady's uh, intercession, uh, he had a great devotion to the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and he attributed all that he received during life, all the successful work that he had done in uh, mission work, was attributed uh, to Our Lady. And during the mission, he taught frequently to the people to say the little prayer, My Jesus, mercy. You know, this is how we can keep the spirit of prayer always in our hearts, even in the midst of our daily work, no matter how busy, we can always say it in our heart, My Jesus, mercy. My Jesus, mercy. And wherever uh, Leonard preached a mission, he spread the devotion to perpetual adoration of the Blessed Sacrament and the devotion of praying the way of the cross. And this was what he was famously known for, his uh, Stations of the Cross. It was said that he set up almost 600 stations of the cross uh, throughout Italy. 
And back in the old days, uh, only the Franciscans have uh, the, uh, I guess, faculty or authority that was given by the church to set up the Stations of the Cross. You can't just, you know, bless them and put, up, put them up on the wall, but it has to be Franciscans, has to be specific blessings and all this different um, uh, ritual of uh, having the Stations of the Cross uh, set up. But our Lord says in the Gospel for today's feast, if you want to come after me, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. You know, the cross is part of who we are as genuine Christians. We can't get away from the cross, no matter how hard we try. This is our identity in being with the one we are following, being with the one who loves us, who gives himself uh, completely for us. You know, however, we often rebelled against this truth. Uh, we, we know it's the truth. This is not something new, I'm sure, to all of you. We embrace this truth, but oftentimes only intellectually, only in our head. It never goes down to our heart. It's, it's often not interiorly and practically because we often murmur or complain against the cross that our Lord shared with us, that our Lord wants us to be like Him. This is one emphasis that our Holy Father made uh, recently last Sunday at the Mass for the Solemnity of uh, Christ the King. You recall the Gospel uh, passage for that solemnity was the uh, crucifixion scene where our Lord was on the cross and there's the two thieves uh, on either side of our Lord and one of them uh, repented and one of them started defending our Lord, started, uh, you know, telling this other thief to be quiet and realizing of what he and, and, and uh, the one he was talking to deserved that particular uh, sentence. And then how he made that wonderful profession of faith of acknowledging Christ being the king. You know, remember me, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, he has a kingdom, but not of this world. Again, this is one emphasis that our Holy Father made uh, at the Mass last Sunday about this cross. He affirmed, of course, the context then was to the cardinals, but he affirmed to the cardinals and to all of us too, if we want to be true followers of Christ, we have to live according to to God's logic, not to man's logic, not to our own logic, noting that the cross is a critical uh, point of faith. Uh, he brought up the point about that the cross was the critical point of the faith for uh, Simon Peter and the other apostles. And they were men, he said, and they thought as men, not as God because they could not tolerate the idea of a crucified Messiah, of a crucified Christ, of a crucified Lord, of a crucified Savior. In fact, today's passage is really immediately after our Lord uh, rebuked Peter because he was trying to prevent our Lord to embrace the cross, to go to the passion of His in order uh, to save all of us. And our Holy Father made up this beautiful meditation, which is worth meditating for a long time, really, about how many people at that time, at that scene of the and Calvary, many of them uh, was asking our Lord to come down from the cross. You know, if you are truly the Savior, come down from the cross and save us. And our Holy Father said, you know, they mocked him, but 
it is also a way to excuse themselves as if to say, I quote, it isn't our fault that you are on the cross. It's only your fault because if you truly were the Son of God, the King of the Jews, you would not be there. But you would save yourself by coming down from the infamous scaffold. Hence, if you stay there, it means that you are mistaken and that we are right. And then he brought up about the, the thief, the, the, the repentant thief on the cross. He said, of course, the good thief is on the cross like Jesus. But above all, he is on the cross with Jesus. The good thief is on the cross like Jesus. But above all, he is on the cross with Jesus. And then he said, as opposed to the other evildoer, and of all the others who mocked him, he does not ask Jesus to come down from the cross or to make him come down. Instead, he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He sees him on the cross, disfigured, unrecognizable, and yet he entrusts himself to him as to a king. More than that, as the king. The good thief believes what is written on that plague plaque above our Lord's head, the king of the Jews. He believes and entrusts himself. I think we try to put ourselves in the position of this repentant thief. What, what did he see? First, he saw the sign that's written in Hebrew, in Greek, and Latin. Say, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. That's why our Lord was condemned. That was his sentence because of that truth. And the thief did not see Jesus with the crown, uh, with the gold crown on his head, with a beautiful splendor on his, uh, on his robe that he wear. You know, he, he was... His clothing, his clothing was not transfigured as of Mount Tabor. He was not transfigured as he was at Mount Tabor. No, his face and his body has been beaten so much that he looked like not a body, not a normal human body. And he doesn't look like having a glorious splendor face, a kingly face, but it's been badly beaten. All these bloody things in his body and all these bloody things in his uh, face. Our Holy Father said that the good thief had a barely sketched faith. He had a barely sketched faith, but he had faith. He had faith to be able to see through all that and make a conclusion that he is truly the king. You know, he read that sign of the condemnation of our Lord being the king of the Jews, and he believed in his heart and he professed our Lord's kingship. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. I think this helps us to reflect on this. This helps us in our Eucharistic adoration. You know, we don't see our Lord in a physical way, we don't see his humanity. We don't even see his divinity. But yet, we got to break through and seeing of who we are gazing upon is Christ our King. Christ our Lord who died for us and who often, um, who, who, lo who loves us and constantly gives himself completely uh, to us. Back to our Holy Father's word, uh, Peter's conversion was realized fully when he gave up trying to save Jesus and accepted being saved by our Lord. He gave up wanting to save Jesus from the cross and accepted being saved by his cross. And then he said, Peter's ministry consists altogether in his faith, a faith that Jesus recognizes immediately from the beginning as a genuine faith, as a gift from the Heavenly Father. 
but a faith that must go through the scandal of the cross to become authentic faith, to become truly Christian, to become rock on which Jesus can build his church. And then he said participation in Jesus' lordship is verified concretely only in sharing in his abasement with the cross. Of course, the cross, you know, it's, it's necessary. Uh, you know, what does the, the cross presume that we have? The cross presume that we have faith. The cross without faith, we often think, oh, it's a curse. It's a bad luck or whatever we want to call it. But a cross with our faith being exercised is a blessing. It's a fount of abundant graces and abundant uh, wisdom. Again, I think it's amazing to, to meditate upon uh, St. Dismas, uh, the, the repentant thief whom the Lord promised uh, heaven, to be able to see through all that what our Lord looked like looking at that sign and then conclude that he is truly the king of the Jews. He is truly the king of kings and lord of lords. Do we have uh, even a sketch faith like St. Dismas? I think the problem is that we, we don't necessarily not have faith. I think many of us have faith. I think the problem is that we, uh, we lack in using our faith. We lack in exercising our faith, especially in the difficult moment that it's hard to understand why does God allow this thing to happen in my life? Why does my spouse betray me? Why does my family don't talk to me? Blah, 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 etc., etc., etc. You know, when those moments come, we often turn off, so to speak, the use of our faith, the use, the exercising of our faith. Oh, we, we constantly murmur, we constantly complain, then we can't see through. You know, I, I myself have difficulty at times when difficult moments come about. So it is, it is an act of the will that we have to exercise. Yes, Lord, I know you love me. I know nothing that happens in my life, you are not ignorant of them all. I know you are aware of every single moment of my life and you permit all these things to happen for my good and for the good of my family, for the good of my community, for the good of the church, and on and on and on. You know, it's okay to recognize how bad our crosses are, but we can't stop there. We got to go further. Lord, I place my trust and my confidence in you. Again, St. Leonard Port Maurice was a big promoter of the Stations of the Cross. He said, you know, the Stations of the Cross is a remedy for all evils in the world and in ourselves with sins and vices. He said the Stations of the Cross, uh, remedy for all these evils, he said, it's a powerful protection against the surging tide of vice and fill all with the greatest blessings of virtue who engage in loving reflection on the sufferings and love of Jesus Christ. He said, For the way of the cross is the antidote for vice, the cleansing of unbridled desires, and an effective incentive to virtue and holiness of life. You know, the cross, again, is part of who we are. We can't avoid the cross for the rest of our life. You know, if we try to avoid it, we may succeed for a while, and then we get another one. We may avoid that, and then we get another one. And we may get a bigger one if we don't accept the other one. And then we end up wanting, oh, I wish I had the previous cross that the Lord gave us, you know, which was much lighter than what I have now, and on. And of course, when we pray the Stations of the Cross, the church uh, offers a plenary indulgence, and we can offer that uh, for the poor souls in purgatory. You know, this week, uh, last Sunday, we celebrate the great solemnity of Christ the King. And this week, 
we celebrated the feast of several martyrs, St. Cecilia, uh, Blessed Miguel Pro, and 117 uh, Vietnamese uh, martyrs. They knew the value of the cross on earth, that they, won't, that they were not afraid to embrace them even to the point of death. And so let us beg St. Leonard, uh, the great missionary of the 18th century, who is an illustrious herald of the mystery of the cross, as the opening prayer said, that through his prayers we may come to know the riches of the cross on earth in order to attain its reward in heaven.